What is going on, Notre Dame fans? Mike Singer and Mike Goolsby with this week's Mike Goolsby Show. Really cool episode today. Got multiple guests on this week's show, including Notre Dame great Shane Walton. Will be pretty cool to have another one of Mike Goolsby's teammates on this week's show. Mr. Goolsby, you just look like you got some sun today. You look vibrant. You're showing everybody your, your MLB team with the hat. Yeah. What's new in Mike Goolsby's world, man? Yeah, I did a, quite a bit of lawn work today. Thanks for noticing. Took advantage of some nice weather here in Nebraska. Things are good, man. Um, you know, this is that this that part of the year, brother. It's a bit of a lull, you know, as, as far as football is concerned. I think we still got the, you know, the USFL or whatever it is, you know, this uh, alternative league. I've, I've yet to watch any. But, uh, man – yeah, you know, NFL drafts over. You're just kind of counting down the days until uh, college football kickoff. Mike, I want to mention real quick: the last time we had you on a YouTube video here at Blue and Gold was that uh, you know Tyler Buckner just entered, you know, the portal. Let's talk about it. Video that we did with me and Tim Hyde. Mm -hmm. Eighteen thousand views, not too bad. Five hundred seventy-seven thumbs up. Which folks watching on YouTube right now, please do. Hit that thumbs up, subscribe, of course. you got to be a subscriber to get in the comments, um, at least in the live comments. And uh, if you're listening via podcast, we would appreciate a, a five-star review. Um, yeah, 577 thumbs up. That's really good. Here's a new blue and gold YouTube high. Oh. 493 comments. All right, I say that's a, a, a new high, a new record for us. I, I, I'm, I'm just... It's up there. It's I'm assuming. Be. I'm assuming. That was... Uh, that was a that was a big one. But you know, are we are we technically Mike? Are we technically? Am I a YouTuber? Are you a YouTuber? Are we YouTubers? Kinda. Yeah, it's both not like our full time thing, right? Like I would say, like the writing side. Yeah. Is my my main gig. Obviously, your sales is your main gig. But uh, yeah, we we kind of are. Well, we, we have a big a lot. YouTube channel outside the official one. I know this man. Then again, I can be. A pain in the arse. I, I'm well aware, but we've gotten a lot better. Yeah, you know, you can go back and read old comments on the uh, the iTunes reviews. It was like Goolsby sounds like a drunk guy at a bar or whatever. <laughs> that was like, my we've favorite come a long comment. way. That was my favorite comment ever. I was well, like, the guy wasn't wrong either. The guy wasn't wrong. You know, it's, you know, we kind of stumbled through this kind of the first year or so. But yeah, I mean, um, we've always said it in terms of the Buckner thing, the Hartman thing, any sort of conflict, Mike is good for content yeah um yeah i posted a i made a post on the message board i think i'm finally i'm gonna let this scab kind of heal right mm -hmm. this tyler buckner thing i'm gonna let it heal stop picking at it but i made a post or i reposted a, a youtube video i'd seen of tyler kind of breaking down his high school accolades etc and what you know you got 10 pages of comments on the message board you know so it's good i mean people is as annoying as it might be, it's it's good for uh 360. It helps it helps us get, get through the off season, right? 362 replies on Ghoul's Beast, just saying. I even said something about how I disagreed with you about something. I don't remember what I said though. No, uh, it's fine. I mean, it's um again at, at a certain point, I'm gonna let it go, and I think this might be the episode to do so. I am excited to see Sam Hartman, I am excited to see. You know, what this offense looks like with young players. I'm really excited to see. Um, I'm almost happy for Audric Estime that Logan Diggs left. What were your thoughts he, on Diggs entering the portal? That one seemed kind of unexpected. I predicted it. You know, I've said you, I've said as, you know, and again, on this in this in this format and this medium, Mike, like you know, you're sort of limited in terms of what you can say. Shane, um, you know, Shane Walton, who will be on, you know, he kind of alluded to a couple interesting things. So stay tuned for that interview later on, folks. But um, yeah, I've kind of hinted at the fact that Logan always felt like he had one foot in and one foot out. I always got the sense, Mike, that I thought Logan thought too highly of himself as a player. I thought that Logan thought that he was a better player than he actually was. All of that's, you know, we can kind of set that all to the side. If you're going to have a 230 pound back, like an SMA, it's like very much if you're 230, you want 20 plus carries. It's just peanut butter and jelly, dude. It's peas and carrots, as Forrest Gump said. So 
I'm excited for Audric Estime in particular for this kind of breakout, hopefully become a household name, become a star. Yeah, you said you mentioned peanut butter and jelly. Speaking of Angeli, nice, nice. See, we've gotten <laughs> so good, dude. <laughs> ben Emery says singers boy in jelly might get a shot. I actually went to high school with a guy named Ben Emery. I think I think that was his last name, at least. Maybe when we went to high school together, Ben. Um, yeah, he might. Uh, let's see. A couple other comments. Uh, congrats to the Blue and Gold Show. Keep it going. Thank you very much. Uh, love the show, Mike and Mike. Ian's a, Ian's a big fan of you um, as well. Irish17 says, we are social media influencers. We're not even YouTubers, Mike. We are uh, social media influencers. Oof. Uh, Drunk Vigo was in the chats um, earlier. Says, I remember Shane Walton. I, I titled this interview with the Notre Dame great Shane Walton. I'm already getting crap that I didn't put again. Um, again. But of course, uh, of course, I, I, I can't do too much right these days. And but. that interview, and this is, we hear a lot about the Notre Dame, Notre Dame Brotherhood. Um, and I think maybe that most programs feel that way or can kind of speak of a brotherhood. But, you know, I haven't spoken to Shane, seen Shane in 20 plus years. You know, we jump on this, 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 you know, feed, this video feed. And it was just like, we're right back in the huddle. You know, I got a tinge emotional there at the end. You know, I said so off when we got off the air, we finished recording. So, yeah, it's great to catch up with Shane. Uh, great interview as expected. Had you guys not like interacted since your playing days? <sighs> no, not really. I and I and I thought I had his number, but one digit was was incorrect in terms of the the way I'd saved his number. Now, now, and I don't want to you know bury the lead here, or whatever the expression is, Mike. Yeah. Um, Shane reached out to me because of my support of Tyler Buckner. I mean, he reached cetera, out to me cetera. first, but yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. So he reached out to me first to get. Oh, did he? <laughs> <laughs> to get in touch with you. <laughs> okay, fair enough. That's really speaking. So yeah, so Shane had some Shane had some thoughts about the Tyler Buckner situation, the competition, etc. So that's what you know kind of brought us brought us back together. And I thought, you know, again, I said as much on the when we were recording, like he knocked it out of the park. Yeah, Buckner's junior season accounted for 81 touchdowns and I think it was like 7,000, 8,000 yards. At, He's no at, Sam Hartman, but yeah, it was pretty impressive. La Jolla, the Bishop School, and of course Shane Walton graduated from the Bishop School in, was he class of 98, I believe, um, and currently is the head coach at the Bishop School. I think his first year as the head coach there was like the year Buckner transferred out or something. So He was uh, the Walton. defensive coordinator. He was the, you're the, you're right. He was the D.C. Um, when, when Buckner was there and Buckner played safety as a freshman. So, um, yeah, Walton was able to, to, you know, actually coach him on that side of the ball. Um, you know, th that freshman year and Buckner was a really good safety, um, as, as well. Like for, I, I think he would have been a college safety. I mean, like seriously, Buckner is a fantastic athlete. He, he, he's, he could have played a multiple multitude of positions and uh sports. Real... and sports brother and oh sports. yeah yeah lacrosse i think yeah he had a bunch of offers in like middle school or something as a lacrosse player like big time we're moving on though we're moving yeah we're on. moving on yeah we're moving on mike ireland game navy august 26th i'm just gonna go out and say i'm just gonna put this out there it's my birthday <laughs> of course <laughs> my birthday is on the navy game uh it's a big one it's how old are you one. turning how old will you be turning 30. oh wow a that's one. a big birthday it's a big one mike we talked about 30 is a weird age for a guy it's an interesting age so and man i'm thinking my 30th birthday where would i want to be i might even want to be in ireland and we actually have a really good guest to talk about that. If folks want to go to Ireland again, folks, let's let's just take a look at the schedule real quick. Navy, Dublin to Ireland. I mean, if you're a Fighting Irish fan, this is the homeland. So let's bring on our guy JP Cohn, Executive Global Tours. He can get you out to Ireland. Can you tell us about this this deal, this yes. package going on, JP? Yeah, I'll be happy to do that. Hi, hi, Mike, and hi, Mike. Uh, thanks, gentlemen, for having me on. Um, we're flying over on the 21st of August, arriving on the 22nd. 
and we'll be in Northern Ireland for three nights uh, in visiting Belfast and Derry. And then we'll be three nights in Dublin. Uh, we'll be playing top links golf courses. And for non-golfers, we'll be visiting top attractions uh, in Belfast from uh, the Titanic to the Game of Thrones. Uh, then in Derry, we'll be seeing the city of Derry with the famous walls and also uh, the Derry Girls that are on Netflix as well, uh, where, where their tour is. And then in Dublin, we have uh, two tailgate parties. The tour will be led by Mike Golick. And of course, the two of you gentlemen are well, will be happy to have on the tour. Uh, Irv Smith is coming and a bunch of other Notre Dame legends will be on the trip as well. Um, so it's going to be a lot of fun. Last year... We did a very great, uh, successful trip for the Nebraska game with Nebraska legends and with the Irish legends. It'll be even more fun uh, this year. Alison Hayes from ABC is coming as well. And uh, Lisa Kelly, um, who wrote the books about the Notre Dame uh, former players. So it's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to go to the Guinness Storehouse and Jameson in Dublin as well and uh, have some pints and some great Guinness. Guinness, uh, pints of great Guinness and whiskey. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, Irish 17 says genuine Irish pubs. I mean, yeah, they they don't get much more genuine than that. So JP, um, this is so people sign up through you yeah. guys. So That's you right, said, right. you know, Golic, uh, Irv, like yeah. potentially Goolsby. Yes. Can the, will the Notre Dame fans, and I guess potentially me, will the Notre Dame fans get to actually spend time? With, oh, yes, they'll spend quality time during the trip um, with, with the players and interact with them and hear stories. Um, and we'll also be doing tailgating. So tailgating in Ireland is different than what you're used to over here uh, in the States. Uh, so it'll be in a pub, but it'll be more um, kind of friendly meet and greet. I guess you you would call it more of a meet and greet, but um, yeah, we'll have um, different local whiskeys to try as well, and um, it'll be very you know friendly. Also, we're going to be meeting with I don't know if you know, but in Ireland and Northern Ireland, they can't play football in Northern Ireland until they're 15 years of age because of the insurance. So we're going to be with the Irish teams. There's 14 American football teams in throughout Northern Ireland and Ireland and they're called the Irish Wolfhounds and uh, yeah. we're going to be with them on the 22nd all the coaches and players they'll be mingling with the um, Notre Dame legends on the 22nd in the botanical pub in um, Belfast so it'll be you know you'll meet the locals as well on the tour and um, they're actually going to have the high school game, as you probably both know, on the Friday, the day before the Notre Dame Navy game. So a lot of those young players will be meeting with uh, the people on the tour as well. I wonder if this high school team needs a linebacker coach, Mike. Yeah. Or a linebacker. Can you just yeah, yeah. You That's great. JP, could you set up? Um, I think people understand the golf. Could you break down what game day is going to look like on the, on yes, the tour? So, yes. So game day, we're going to have three hours of uh, the tailgating at the Odeon pub, which is right near the stadium. And the fans are all going to be able to meet with the uh, legends like yourself and Mike um, and all the guys that are coming on the tour. Uh, we're also going to have um, Irish um, sports stars there as well from rugby legends like Shane Byrne and uh, Irish women legends like Anna, Anna Caprice um, so that we'll have a, a mixture of Irish sports stars with, with the American stars as well. Tremendous. And in terms of how people can get involved or get more information, JP, pop your email they, up here on the screen. And, and yes, they can email us or ring us or uh, we're on Instagram and Twitter, or Facebook, whatever way they want to contact us. But the email will be handy. And if they use um, your code, Mike, that would be great. Yep. So the email JP at executive global tours.com, reading this off the podcast audience, and then use the code. Uh, Goolsby 41 uh, when when signing up. Goolsby, you have anything to add? Oh, of course. So this is the pitch. Um, if I get X enough, uh, X Amount? number of play, people, excuse me, X number of people to sign up through JP, Singer and I go for free. So then so there's a lot of pod content to be had. Um, 
while we're over there. So I think it's a really unique opportunity for our fans, for our fan base, um, and the kind of content that we'll get a chance to put out. So if you're going to go, if you want to go, you're thinking about going, you got friends that are thinking about going, sign up, use the code. Mike and I um, will be over there. And so, And I fully intend, I mean, I will be parked at the pub. Uh, I'm not a big golfer. I'll go out there. But um, lots of stories to tell. So it'd be like uh, the podcast on steroids. Cool. As, as I can already see it, Goolsby, us doing a live broadcast, us just sitting in the same room. You know, with the people who use code ghouls be 41 watching live in the same Why room. Not? Why not? I mean, go live from the pub. I mean, sky's the limit. I'm just getting uh, excited thinking about it. Yeah, no, it is. It is exciting. It's an exciting opportunity that JP kind of brought to us. Um, so, yeah, use the code and, you know, kind of spread the word. But it should be a good little party over there. Yeah, if you can't do it, maybe you have, a, you know, your own com- little community of Notre Dame fans. Drop the email, you drop the code to your buddies. Um, and yeah, and, and if one of your buddies does sign up, you let me know. Like, hey, I got my guy to sign up. He's going. I, I mean, seriously, this is once in a lifetime to go over it's to It's Ireland. a bucket list trip. Yeah, it doesn't happen every year, gentlemen, as you both know. And, uh, you know, last time was eight years ago. And so, yeah, it's, it's going to be a lot of fun. And it's the home of, you know, Notre Dame originally, right? All the priests and everything were from Ireland that started the schools. So. It's a great opportunity to meet the locals because our tour, you meet the locals, you have fun with the locals. It's not just American people, which is great to be with American people, but you get to meet and experience what local people are doing as well. So, yeah, I've only, heard, I've, only heard, I've only heard amazing things, JP, too. I've got I've never been myself, unfortunately. Oh, you'll have a great time. Yeah. People are very yeah. friendly. In both countries. So I'm, I'm 50% Irish, JP. So are you? Oh, brilliant. In a way, getting back to the motherland. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that'd be great. On Singer's 30th birthday. So, folks, yeah, hit him up, JP, at executiveglobaltours.com uh, and make sure you use that code, Goolsby41. Kevin says Mike could meet Mike, yes, because even though Goolsby have known each oh other yeah. and been doing this for three years now. How uh, serendipitous. Not... How serendipitous would that be? You know, your 30th birthday, first time over there, three years, you finally get a chance to meet each other. I don't know if Goolsby would give me a hug. And Mike, we or... gotta share a bed too. I think I think I think <laughs> we're gonna end up sharing a bed too. <laughs> <laughs> the, the full bed, yeah, yeah. Yeah, my, I don't know if Mike's gonna give me a big hug or or you know, hit me, you know, in the sack. I, I don't know. I, I don't know. <laughs> got to, we gotta get there first. Uh, JP, Mike, anything uh, else you guys want to add? Mike, do you have anything you want to say? Uh, no, so. unless you've got, you know, I'm a big logistics guy, JP. So yeah. I, uh, it's my understanding those that want to go, that want to sign up through for your tour, they've got to find their way to New York, correct? Yeah, we have uh, we have flights out of um, Newark and JFK on Aer Lingus and also United. And it's a six hour uh, journey from New York. Or Newark. That's not that bad. Got it. Six okay. hours. Yeah. That's nice. not that long. That's not that long. So again, JP, they email you and or yes. find the website, etc. Pretty straightforward. Yes. Very and cool. We'll be happy to uh, help them out and get it, get them on the tour with you. I love it. Love to have both of you, Mike. Uh, the two of you, Mikes. That'd That's be so great. Awesome. Have a big party for your thirtieth. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I can't. It's a big year in Ireland, by the way. I know you were saying earlier about that, but in Ireland, the 30th birthday is a big thing. I mean, you even mentioned the the Dairy Girls thing. That's one of my favorite shows. Oh, they're very funny. Yeah. Hysterical. And, um, you know, I I recently got into European uh, football. uh, Oh, did you? Okay. And when I first started watching dairy girls is before I got into European football and I couldn't understand anything those girls were saying now. I mean, now that I hear all the different, you know, the, the scouts, you know, all the different, um, you know, native tongue. I mean, I, it's, it's, it's a second, second language, it's second, uh, you know, tongue to me now. I just, I just know it really well. It's, it's so, easy to understand now is what I'm trying to say. Singers yeah, excited. And the wall brewery excited. and dairy. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just saying, Singer's excited. He's very there. excited. Brilliant. Brilliant, yeah. No, the Wald uh, Brewery that we're going to go to in Derry as well has some great uh, beer, craft beer and whiskey, and also they have the gin. So you'll be able to experience, you know, the local uh, food as well as the drinks. So it'd, it'd be a great experience for you. My wife already said she's coming as well. So Oh, I mean, very good. 
This is going to be it's going to be a great time. All right, JP, really appreciate okay. you coming Thank on you, and, and talking with much. us about it. Have well, a good one, JP. Thank you, sir. Cheers. Thank you. That was awesome. Again, folks, JP at executiveglobaltours.com. Do you think he's really Irish, Mike? Oh, my gosh, yeah. Okay. That accent was amazing. I'm kidding, of course. <laughs> okay, it's, called the brogue. Brogue. it's called the Brogue, by the way. Code Goolsby41. Um, so we're about to get to the Shane Walton interview, but Brian Kelly's accent um, and his family uh, had a quick super chat. Wanted to hear the predicted offense defense from Goolsby and Singer, maybe who you want to see starting come end of the year. Goolsby, let's just go 11 personnel offense. Okay. Hmm. Are you yeah. a backwards hat kind of guy, Goolsby? Yeah, depending on. But not on not on the air. You're not going backwards hat on the air. Not not the second, no. <laughs> Why? <laughs> I don't know. I just I just was thinking Colin Cowherd for a second there. Um, okay. Eleven personnel. Sure. Give me in jelly. I'm just give kidding. you in. I'm just kidding. My 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 eleven personnel would be Hartman, Estime, Jaden Thomas. Um, why am I blanking at receiver? You got Colsey. Oh, no. Merriweather. Why am I blanking? You got too excited about Ireland. I, I know. All right, let me pull up the scholarship chart real quick. Jesus Christ. So I'll go Sam Hartman, Estime. You know, the, the, there's a little tag there to the question. Who do you want to see starting come end of year? I'd love to see... Eli Raritan come back. And if I can't get Eli back, I'd love to see Jagasaw starting at the end of the year interior wise. Yeah. People say he's a tackle. To me, I see guard. I see dominant yeah. guard. Um, receiver, I'd like to see somebody really give Colsey a run for their money. Uh, frankly, I don't care. To me, I kind of look at them all the same. They're all young, they're all inexperienced. I think Tobias probably has the highest upside. He seems a little bit goofy to me in terms of like, it's time to really grow up quick. There's uh, some big expectations on him. Um, so yeah, Braylon James is a guy that I'd love to see shine. I just, in terms of like a deep ball connection, he's somebody that I'm excited to see. Yeah. Yeah. If for receivers, I feel like, I don't know, man. It seems like some good Look players. How they are. Look how young they are. I just think one of those freshmen, probably Great House, is, is going to be a starter. I wouldn't be shocked at all. I think it's just look at it. Like, Dion Colsey is probably someone or maybe someone who could be passed. Well, so starter is one thing. Maybe play a lot like one of those young guys. I mean, absolutely. Great House has got the physicality. He's got the, the body. He came from a tremendous high school program. But, you know, we talk about ceiling and floor, right? So is, is he close to being maxed out in terms of his potential? Maybe so. I mean, he reminds me of like a Larry Fitzgerald. Like, I mean, even physically. I like that. Yeah. Like that, like, again, just his build, uh, the reliability factor. But I want to see somebody that can make a gosh darn play, bro. You know, so somebody that's going to take the top off the defense. So you're so, somewhat I, – I don't believe that that Colsey can be that guy personally. Um, so it's either going to be Tobias or Braylon James to me. So I just want to see, and everybody does, is yeah. you know, 30, 40, 50-yard bombs, and that's really kind of Sam Hartman's game based off this, the Wake Forest sample size that we've seen. So Braylon James would be kind of my uh, – you know, he's kind of underrated, kind of under the radar at, at, at this point in time, but I just like his ability to take the top off the of defense. Yeah, I think Great House may not be like a a starter, even though like starter. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It uh, it doesn't because like Tyree might, you know, be they might do a twenty two personnel in the first play game. Like, yeah, they technically started, but so I think it's more like who gets the most snaps. I think Great House will play a ton, but like Colsey, Merriweather, Thomas might be kind of the safe. Again, um, Mike, they're all kind of clumped together. They you are. Know, I mean, Colsey's oh, got the most them, experience, really. and he's got what? I mean, him. He's behind Jaden Thomas. I mean, there's forty career catches between the two of them off yeah. the top of my head. So, uh, sky's the limit. Yeah. To me, I want to see playmakers. That's the most fun thing. Yep. Tight end Mitchell Evans. I think we can both agree there. Until yeah. I, I, you know, get... la last night, man, I was I for some reason I had the Notre Dame Syracuse game DVR'd. 
Um, Mitch Evans is like physically he's a Michael Mayer clone. I mean, if they swap jerseys, you wouldn't be able to tell them apart. So this is his year. I mean, it's it it's him and Holden stays at the for the time being. So uh, but to me, it really comes down to estimate. I mean, he's really your only behind Hartman, uh, at least in an ND uniform, you your only proven commodity that you have. And the more you give him the ball, I think the better he's gonna play. And then offensive line looks like from left to right, something like all Shrouf, Carell, Christophic, Fisher, at least to start the year, Mike. Sure. Yeah. And I think, you know, a guy like Jagasaw, um, he just kind of gives you gives you a little bit of hope. Like I, I'm I'm hopeful that we get a chance to see him as as a fan because he's a monster. He yeah. really is. Yeah. All right, then let's run through this real quick. Defense, you know. If you want to go, uh, I don't know, four four two five or something, you know, I don't, I don't know what the what, or maybe if you want to call the now just a four three, you know, Rover included in the linebackers. What would you what would you like on the defense, Mike? Um. So yeah, this John Baptiste, I gotta see it. I want to see Batel as your starter. Cross. Um. Gosh. Mills probably so but again this is such a rotate it's such a yeah. rotation i'm Hard. looking at like is that's all a rotation to your point who's going to be your starter i'm yeah. looking at this like who's going to pop yeah. right so it's like gabe rubio played quite a bit last year like can he who's going to make some plays i absolutely see and i'll go out and freaking predict it i think patello gets double digit sacks just because i've seen enough of him working moves like in that, you know, you saw from Fosk, you saw a lot of long arm. You saw him just kind of running the rail. There wasn't a lot of like craftiness in terms of like what he had in his bag. But Tello's got tricks up his sleeve as a rusher, and we know he plays hard. Um, at the linebacker spot, I want somebody that can make plays. Again, I, I know Sneed's got that playmaking DNA. I know Kaiser's made some plays. You know, and again, I'll go back to rooting for Maris, but he's on a super short leash, bro. Um, I just want to see some, you know, some turnovers, some forced fumbles, et cetera, some splash plays safety. I'm worried. It, it ought to be Ramon and Xavier Xavier at the end of last year dropped like a handful of picks. Um, Xavier, it's time, bro. You're an Omaha kid. It is time uh, to go shine. Um, and corner, I think you can get a nice little rotation. I don't understand why they have, I'll say this again. I don't understand why you have Clarence Lewis playing slot corner. To me, on paper, my prediction by the end of the year, Mickey's your starting nickel. It's just – it's painfully obvious to me. Yeah. Um, it's just the way he's built. He likes to jump routes. I mean – Very aggressive. A highly competitive guy. Put Mickey as your as your slot corner. It's, yeah. It makes – Dude, it's one of those things that Notre Dame does in terms of, like, evaluating their own your own talent where it takes them half a season to figure it out. But Cam Hart, Ben Morrison, and Jaden Mickey, that's a pretty badass trio. And then Clarence Lewis, you know, and, and, you know, to come in as a, in a dime, like that experience, the guy was a starter as a freshman. Like, yeah. Christian Gray, Scott Talent. I mean, Tucker and Bond. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, I mean, it's a really good room. We just want to see again. My focus is like, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of cousin to what I want on the, everybody wants to see the deep shots on the offense. And then on the defensive side of the ball, I think we were like 113th last year in turnovers. We need to create some more turnovers. I yeah. mean, let's see it. Yeah. All right, Brian Kelly's accent. Really appreciate the super chat. Uh, all right, moving along, Ghouls. We were going to spend about 20 minutes talking about Sam Hartman and uh, Tyler Buckner. Well, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Right, we are going to get into our interview uh, with former Notre Dame safety. I mean, and one heck of a soccer corner, player. Corner, Mike. He was a corner. That's. I'm sorry. Yes, yes. Former Notre Dame corner. A little bit before my time. Uh, yeah, former Notre Dame corner, and uh, a fantastic soccer player for the Irish as well. Big East freshman of the year. All right, we're going to go ahead and get into that. Um, this was something we recorded a few days ago, uh, but I will be reading the the chats. So, uh, yeah, if you got anything for me, I uh, will interact with you guys in the chat uh, on YouTube here. But without further ado, here we go. Alrighty, folks, time to bring in Shane Walton, former Notre Dame defensive back. You might even know him as a former Notre Dame soccer player, Big East freshman of the year after leading the team and scoring in 98. 
then walking on to the Irish football team as a sophomore and a unanimous first team All American as a senior in 2002. Not a bad, um, you know, little introduction there for you, Mr. Walden. How are you doing, sir? I'm good, brother. It's good to be on. I, I know Mike and I uh, spoke last week, and I was I watched the show, so I'm excited to to be on. Yeah, do you like the yeah, show? Do you like the show, Shane? Do you like what you, Mr. Goolsby's always saying? I do. I love it. I, there's a bunch of like Notre Dame guys who are doing podcasts, and again, like you know, you play with someone, uh, and you just have a different level of like admiration and respect, especially at Notre Dame. It's like a brotherhood, right? And I, so when I saw that he was on, I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna watch this show. Yeah, I'm gonna support him. So I love his take. He talks like he played. I love it. No nonsense. Like let's just get get straight to it. Cut all the BS out. Amen. Hey man, <laughs> I've, I think I've calmed down a little bit at 40, Shane. Um, but yeah, you know, you got to be yourself. So yeah, it's great having you on. This is uh, what, Mike, this is our fourth or fifth kind of like ex player that we've had on. Yep. And I've made it a, a bit of a mission, Shane, to get, you know, guys that I know yeah. that were truly Notre Dame greats. Again, not named uh, Tim Brown or, or Jerome Bettis. Um, and you've been on kind of my short list. So I'm glad you reached out a couple of weeks ago. Um, you're currently coaching high school football now, correct? Just I am. For, for the yeah, where, right. I, where I went to high school. Okay. So I want to jump back to when you were in high school and like your recruitment was football. And this is before, you know, you walked down to the team. This yeah. is you coming up as a youngster. Was football like ever an idea as a sophomore, junior high school, or was it strictly soccer? You know, my I grew up playing football, just really is a funny story. Where I really learned how to play football was in the front lawn of Juvenile Hall. So that was the only grass area in my neighborhood was the okay. front lawn of Juvenile Hall. And, I mean, these guys, like, had no mercy. It was Darnay Scott, who ended up having, like, a, a seven, eight-year career. It was J.J. Stokes, um, who played at UCLA and then played in the, in the pros. And a bunch of really good players in my neighborhood, and they just murdered me. Um, I was like eight years old. They're 14, 15, just, just like no mercy. Okay. And so you had to learn like how to like compete, right? And like there's no like, ah, oh, take it easy on these eight. No, you're playing here. You're you're playing. And so th that was really where I learned like how to play football and how to be tough and how to be physical and and really how to tackle like guys bigger than me, right? Okay. Um, but so soccer was my main sport. I, again, I said I didn't play organized football until I got to high school. Um, and I, again, it wasn't that huge of a jump because I've been playing like in my neighborhood for so long. Um, but as soon as I started playing, I was like, oh, this is a lot easier than soccer. Um, <laughs> like, okay. like soccer, I got to beat someone with the ball at my feet and try to dribble around them. And football, I'm just holding the ball. So it's a lot easier to get around people, right? And so, um, and I think I was in better shape having played soccer for so long. So it, it was the two sports that, you know, there's a, it was a good marriage. Like just understanding um, like angles and understanding things that are developing before they actually develop. Sure. Uh, it, I, I think the two really helped, helped each other out. Yeah. I think that conditioning probably came into play. It helped you talk more shit. I would imagine, you know, <laughs> You had your wind all the time, but I'm talking like recruiting, Shane. Like, were any schools like because yeah, and there's another contributor here on the channel, Tim Hyde, who's a longtime high school football coach out in your kind of area. And I guess you played against Tim's team uh, when you were in high school. So I mean, were you were there schools that were interested in you as a football player? Or was it solely there was a, there was a few. It, it was. Again, my school is it's a small school, so it's not really no it's known for academics. It's not really it. known for uh for football. Um and so like back then, right, everyone's like, Oh, you don't go to one of the big schools, then you just don't no one recruits you. Now they'll they'll try to find you anywhere you are. But I had a little bit of interest from like UCLA, I had a little bit of interest from USC. Um, but Fresno State was my only offer for for football, and that was okay. the receiver. Okay. So you get to Notre Dame freshman, you know, Big East freshman of the year on the soccer pitch. <laughs> Look at you. You like that? <laughs> on the soccer pitch. So I, I, I kind of remember the backstory again. It's been 20 plus years. But what what 
what brought you to football? Was it like you were, weren't you boys with like some of the football players and you guys were chopping it up and you're like, bet, I'm going to, I'm going to try out. How, how did, how did that go? Do you know, I don't even remember the real story anymore. I've heard so many stories. No, um, I, the, how, how it happened was Mike Berticelli was the soccer coach okay. at the time. And he was the one coach that came in, in our house and was like, Hey, what's up? Like, what's going on? I was like, Oh, this is refreshing. Just like was there was no pitch, there was no salesy approach. He was just himself. And I was like, I want to go play for that guy. I don't care what sport it is, I want to play for him. And then like through the recruitment, he's like, he goes, Look, I want you. I know your desire to play football. He goes, Let's do this. You play two years of soccer. And then during your soccer, obviously soccer and, and football are both in the fall. And he goes, in the spring, you do, you go do spring football. And then after two years, you make your decision. He goes, I, I feel like it's a win, win, win. Like we win, maybe football wins, and then and then you get to win, so you don't have to make a choice. Um, and so that happened. I had a, a pretty good fall of soccer, um, but I just remember like the the practice fields are, they butt up against each other, um, and I just remember being at soccer practice, and all I was doing was listening to the football practice the entire time, and just feeling like I wanted to be over there and not where I was. And so I did spring football and I think, you know, coach Davey did like, did that deal out of a favor to Mike Berticelli. I don't think he thought I was going to be really worth a shit. Right. Uh, like, yeah, sure. Well, the soccer guy will have, we'll let him come out and practice in spring. Like what the hell do we lose? Right. We're down mm -hmm. numbers anyway. So I, I think I came out and kind of surprised him a little bit. I was like, shoot, I think this guy could play. And so like, I think it was like, you know, five, six spring practices. He goes, Hey, like, if you're serious about this football thing, like, we got an extra scholarship. Would you play? And I was like, yeah, well, let's talk about it after spring. And so that's kind of how everything came came to play. Okay. So then you joined the football team sophomore year of college? No, freshman year. So, well, going into the uh, that summer after my freshman year was when so I you was played old. three years. So you did you start as a junior then, your first year starting? No, I played. So my freshman year, I played soccer. Got it. And then going into that summer, that's when I started football. So I got four years of football. Interesting. So then when did you become, because, you know, what? So I, I got there 2000, which would have been your sophomore year. Is that right? Yeah. And then, so so I was, you, yeah, the I, I'm trying to figure out like when you started, when did you like become a starter on the football team? When I, when did I start or when did I start playing? When were you a starter on the football oh. team? your freshman year okay yeah because I, no I came out my first year I didn't I did I played like spot dude I didn't play very much um I just had to learn the game and transform my body I was like a soccer body right I was like 165 I could run all day but like wasn't as explosive as some of the, like the football guys right and I didn't have the the physique to really get out there and play so it took a year to like transform my body and sure. so so then my second year of football is when I ended up starting. Got it. That's amazing. Amazing. Yeah. And I was, I was telling Singer before we went on air, and I don't know all the stats, bro, but like that 2002 defense was fairly remarkable. And then when you look at the back half of the defense, you've got you, former soccer player, Vontez Duff, former tailback, Glenn Earl, former wide receiver, and then Jerome Sapp, who was like, you know, an all-American safety coming out of high school. Um, and now you're coaching high school football. So, like, and you and I talked a couple weeks ago. As simplistic as you can make it, and you've already touched on, like, the importance of, you know, competition and having that kind of in your DNA, that compete. But what, like, constitutes, what makes a good defense? As a coach, now, now coach, ex-player, former all-American what do you think? I mean, there's some basics, right? But like at the very basic level, and I have three rules for my team. I, number one is to have fun. And number two is to, to know your responsibility. Like you got to know your plays. You got to know the checks. You got to know those things. And number three is just get to the football. Mm -hmm. And so what I want the kids to do is I want them to be having fun. I want them to be accountable to one another. And then I want them to just work their ass off. Like if you can do that, and get to the football like that you can have a good defense right so that means you're disciplined you're having fun and you're flying around 
Yeah. When I look at the 2002 defense. Like, I mean, we were disciplined. We had fun. And like, I watched like Notre Dame games. Now I'm like, shit, like these dudes need to go watch that 2002 defense. Watch how everyone is like, there's a desire and a passion and almost like, uh, like an accountability to get to that damn football. Mm-hmm. Like you miss a tackle. There's three or four other guys right there. Like that, sure. like, I, I talk about it and I get chills because it's like, that was fun. Like guys like knew like, hey, I got to hold up my end right now, right? Like if I'm not doing everything I have to do to get that football, I'm letting people down. Yeah. So I always say it's like, it's the closest thing to like the military, right? Like it, it's not the military, but like you are so dependent on every single person on that defense to do their job and then work their ass off. Again, yeah. we're not going to die if we don't get, if we don't do it. But, like, it's the closest thing to that, right? Yeah, well, I think the accountability piece between the units, and I looked at that defense, I mean, there was leadership on every level. Um, and ironically, I mean, because I, I would say in hindsight, like, you were the star of that defense. And it's like, you know, you're getting leadership from a corner. It's just, it's, it's, it was different. It was unique. But, you know, you touch on as your coach, as your approach as a coach, have fun, be accountable, play your ass off. All three of those things are like intertwined too. I mean, you're going to have more fun if you know what you're doing, right? And it's like and more success. the ball is fun, you know? That's why we're out there. Look, look, yeah, I tell these guys, man, like, look, the the faster you you learn what you are doing and everyone else around you is doing, the more success you have. Mm-hmm. If I know, like, I don't have the two drop, I just got to get to the one. I don't care about the, whatever's coming in because I know I'm just dropping to the one. So you do that, and, like, it allows you to have more success. All, right? all I'm trying to do is put you all in positions to have success. And, like, knowing what you're doing is, like, that's a big damn piece of it. Sure, sure. Well, that's funny. You call it two drops and one drops. You can't just call it a curl and a flat. I got to make it simple, man. <laughs> 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 no, it's always it trips me out because like I went to a really good high school program, like 15 state championships, and it was like one and two drops. And then you had to kind of relearn, like, oh, a one is a flat or whatever. Yeah. You know, it's just interesting. That's I, too funny. I, yeah, I, I make it as simple as possible because I get it. I just I just want them to play fast. I don't want them thinking, like, oh, this guy disappeared. Okay, one, boom, I'm done. Yeah. That's it. So Notre Dame last season had a bit of a breakout performer in Benjamin Morrison and I know you watch the games yeah I mean it, and I've said this and I think it's not unique to me but like you know tailback and corner are the easiest positions for a young kid to step into and I guess that's relatable to you you know playing corner and kind of coming in from the soccer pitch like could you speak to that at all like that transition for a yeah. young corner I, I think there's less going on around you right like I'm not playing middle linebacker where I'm reading the guard and then I'm reading the down block from a tackle and then trying to get my eyes at the backfield and then look to see if I'm going to get cracked by the, by the receiver. Right. Like there's, I'm on the outside and my job is like, if we're a man, like, Hey shit, it's just to cover this guy and take him out. If, if, if I'm in cover three, like I, I got my deep third. Right. So it's kind of like, and everything else is inside of me. And so mm-hmm. I kind of like, it's the one position where, Obviously, I have to know who's dropping under me or where my help is in man coverage, but it, it like it's really like it's it, it, it when you're cerebral at that position, you could be really good, but it does you don't have to be as cerebral, I think, as other positions early on. Got it. Yeah, you can just let your physical ability take over, and you can see that in Benjamin Morrison, right? Like the guy is he's special, and he has a, a confidence about him. He's, he's not afraid of, of people running away from him. He can go up and, and get jump balls and win those. He can he's good out of his out of his back pedal. Um, but you could also see that there's things that maybe he doesn't understand where the, the droppers are. Because if he understood he had a, a dropper underneath, maybe he doesn't he doesn't fall for the stop and go, right? Because it's covered. So that piece of it for him will come, I'm sure. But like when he has that raw ability, like in the athletic ability to play as a freshman, he's gonna be special, man. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I go back to you and that's, I'm just, I'm listening to you talk and I'm just kind of replaying some of these things in my, in my head that you talked about Benjamin Morrison having confidence mm-hmm. and you were oozing confidence. And I don't buy that. That's like 
sometimes and I know Coach Bear used to say this, like sometimes you almost have to have like fake energy because it yeah. can be contagious regardless, you know. Um, yeah. that confidence, is that just something you're born with, or is that something you can instill in players? You Your know, thoughts, sir? confidence is is um you can definitely grow it right and it comes with knowledge and it comes with uh experience and having the small successes in order to build on on top of those but i i look at it and and i see what you can't teach is like the desire and the drive to be great hmm. and i think you're born with i have two sons and my oldest son isaiah this dude i mean if i beat him in candyland he's pissed Right. If I if we play like war and I win, he he cannot take losing. My other son, Noah, I love him to death. He's just as happy that I'm there. And he's mm -hmm. happy he's included. Right. And so I think you're born with those things. And I see like Isaiah just wants to compete. And like he doesn't even care about winning. He just refuses to lose. Like Got he it. hates it. And he just wants to compete. Everything's a competition. I but love that warm-up lap in baseball. He's no one can beat him. He's sprinting. He's looking back to see how close people are. So, like, I don't think – I think you're born with that. And I think confidence is something that you can get, I mean, uh, through having small successes um, and understanding what you're supposed to do. But that, that desire and that drive and that competition, its you can't teach that. That's fascinating, especially with young people now with all the distractions. You know, mm -hmm. I train young kids on the side – some higher level kids. And I, I tweeted out months ago, I was like, I hope the kids still want to be great. You mm -hmm. know, like I grew up watching Jordan, you know, and it was just like, what a blessing it was for me to be eight, nine, 10, 11 years old, like watching the goat uh, <laughs> and the way he handled himself. And I'm just like, man, like Shane Walton's a, a unanimous all American seven picks, you know, two for touchdowns, all these great things. It's like, you're probably harder to harder to find on the internet than just some random sophomore down the road that created his own YouTube channel and whatever else. So it's like kids can almost develop their own clout. <laughs> yes. And it's like fake greatness. You know, I'll see kids go out to the to the field and like take a selfie, hashtag like on my grind, and don't even break a sweat, you know? <laughs> but all their friends think that they're out there working. So it's, work it. yeah. it's really interesting. Yeah. that dynamic with young people how you can kind of create fake greatness and create attention for yourselves and it's uh you know i think it can be debilitating at times you know i it's i call it like uh disablement by enablement hmm. it right? gets so much without with with doing this much and it's like they get all this attention and all this like this lore like all this and they didn't do anything like what you haven't done anything so i i in at at my at my school, I see the guys who are going to, I know who's going to do it well. Just had a coach in my office and he's asking me, like, who loves football? I'm like, this dude loves football. This guy has more offers, but this guy loves football. He I goes, I love this guy. I'm like, yeah, me too. Yeah. Hey, all this, like, Twitter and Instagram, all this stuff is, like, ruining these kids, man. Like, they, they're getting so much value and acceptance and approval from, like, this fake world. Right. And it's like, it, it's a trip, but I, but I feel bad for them too. Right. I mean, this isn't true. us yeah. chastising the kids. It's like, you know, if I was 14, I'd be probably doing the same thing. Right. Oh, 100%. It's, they, it's a different world. Just like college football is a different world and we're just having to adjust to it. But um, yeah, it's, it's tough to be a kid these days, man. Like there's, they're pulled in so many different ways. Every mistake they make is like the world can see it. I did so much dumb shit growing up, but like, only people that saw it were the people that were around me. It wasn't on YouTube, right? Like, thank God they didn't have cell phone cameras right? back here in school. Thank God, <laughs> <laughs> like for real. For I don't have this yeah. job now. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, we used to, yeah, because yeah, we used to do like, like, like selling our books back. You know, like we could have got kicked out of school for that. Like, I didn't even think about it back then. It was just like, oh, I could make three hundred bucks selling my free books back. Like, just dumb stuff, you know. In the summer, I remember. Uh, couple of the guys i'll keep them nameless they got a bunch of fireworks and we're in the in their car just driving around shooting fireworks at people sure uh, imagine if that's like on video now uh, kids are gone probably yeah. arrested <laughs> yeah yeah and that's probably the most g-rated thing we could you know, touch on well how did you get into coaching because you, know, you you got drafted to the rams yeah you know 
time flies. How did you how did you find yourself back in football? You know, I was when I left my senior year from my high school, I, I had a meeting with the headmaster and he goes, Hey, there's he goes, You're different. He goes, You came here and you were successful. Um, and you did it because you you just worked and you you could grind. He goes, I want you to know that if you ever want a job, you have a job here. Hmm. So now you fast forward, I'm I'm kind of like football's done. I had back surgery. I'm I'm just I'm a broken commodity, right? I'm not like nobody wants me anymore. I'm like, what do I want to do? And so I, I picked up the phone, I called the headmaster. I'm like, hey, think about moving back to San Diego. You like you have a job. He goes, be here Monday morning, eight o'clock. And so I started working here. And um at the time, like I did I wanted nothing to do with football. Like I if I could have just walked away from football, like on my own accord, like it would have been different, right? But so like, true, so true. But being hurt and like not being able to like just say goodbye to the sport, like I never got to really prove or be what I thought I could be, and that that was tough for me. Um, and then so I had a difficult relationship with football. And so my first three four years working at the school, I I didn't go to a football game. I didn't want anything to do with it. And then they hired this young coach. And he goes, dude, like, I'd love you're here. You know, the kids like I'd love for you to coach. I'm like, ah, I'm not interested. He goes, like, you can come one day a week. He goes, I just want you around. He goes, I, I know you know the game. Like anything you could give would be awesome. And so I did that 15 years ago. And that guy and I are best friends now. And um, like the rest is history. I, I just fell in love with pouring out what I had in my heart and mind into these kids and hopefully yep. that they receive those messages and, and grow from them. Yeah. I think um, my story is very similar. You know, I like to say, Shane, like when I'm done, when I was done with football or when football was done with me rather. Yep. Um, and yeah, that transition, that's like, you love the game, but you kind of resent it at the same time. You know, I had Aaron Taylor on, he was actually the first former player that I had. And I saw he had tweeted some stuff about like beyond football. Uh, and I just, it really, it really resonated with me. So I brought him on the show and like, you know, he went through, I mean, and he was a great player, you know, won Super Bowls, made millions of dollars. And it's like, and a guy like that even struggles. So uh, it's, it's almost like you're institutionalized, right? Like you have this, <laughs> um, like every second of your day is like planned for you. And then you leave that and you're in this new world and like you have to plan out all your day and do everything yourself. And it's like, it's, it's like, it's scary, right? It's like the fear of the unknown, it's fear of change, it's fear of like failure, it's fear of success. It's a lot of different things like and you're on your own. And so, you know, that that can be difficult for a lot of people. Yeah, and I think re-identifying yourself too is is yeah me personally but again that like you kind of stayed away from the game for three four years i did the same thing i came back to it almost as like free therapy like let me get all this out of my system and let me pay it forward to the next generation of kids and that's i mean that's how i got involved with it and yeah i've been doing it for 15 20 years myself you yeah, know it's, it's you know it's refreshing you you get that that one kid that is you see has the ability and has the drive, but doesn't have the the skills and the tools and be able to like teach those to that kid is just freaking awesome. And then watch them go and grow and like, it's it's incredible. And even the yeah. ones that are terrible that are never ever gonna play like a down for you, but like what you can do in their life is just incredible. I've had like great coaches and I've had terrible coaches and I remember every single one of them, right? And so I, I want to be the coach that is like, man, like, the guy loved me no matter what. He didn't care if I was great. He didn't care if I was terrible. He didn't care like anything. He just loved me for me and, and helped me grow uh, my skills, my confidence, and just like in life lessons. Yeah, I think um, that's so interesting because, yeah, I've had a couple kids that have been like highly ranked kids, and it's like, in a lot of ways, Shane, like I'm almost more proud of them and what they've accomplished than anything I did in, in, a, in a weird way. It's very strange, but it, it is moving on to coaching. Um, you've had a lot of bad coaches, <laughs> as have I. <laughs> and this is something people need to understand, too. Like even at the college level, even at a Notre Dame, and we're not using throwing anybody under the bus, per se, but like 
I could say that my bad coaches, most of them were pretty bad, um, made me a better coach because I remember what it felt like to have this guy yelling at me. It's like, coach, I don't know what you're trying to get me to do right now. So it's like, I can remember how painful that was. And it's made me a better communicator with young, young people. Right. Yeah. That's the way it is. Right. Like I, I talk to my coaches, every coach I hire, I, I tell them like, look, you have to earn the right to coach these kids and you got to love them. You got to build a relationship and learn how they need to be pushed. Mm -hmm. Right. That to me is coaching one-on-one. -on -one. If I don't know you, like, how do I know how to challenge you? How do I know how you grow? How do I know how you learn? And so like that is is the biggest piece is um, them getting to know you um, and then challenge you in that way. But the, I, I look at coaches like I do. I hate the seven on seven stuff, but we'll go do some seven on seven tournaments. And I'm watching coaches like MF people and like this. Dude, what are you doing? What? I'm like they don't know what they're doing. That's why they're making mistakes. That's your job to teach them. Uh, and yep. whatever's in your mind, you have to teach it in a digestible way that they can understand. But you are mad and frustrated and you're projecting on this kid for not understanding how you want him to do something. Like that's not football. Football is not yelling and cussing at a kid. Football and coaching is, again, transferring what's in here into their minds in the way that they can best hear it. It's so true. Is miss. It's so true. Yeah, and a lot of times kids, and this is like at a college level, like they're scared of their coach. You know, and, 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 you know, fear means respect. It's the same thing, but like they, like they're scared of their coach. So then they get to a point where they're afraid to ask them a question about something that they feel like they should already know. And it's like, man, that's a real slippery slope. Cause now coach assumes that, you know, this thing, you know, it's, it, it can get messy. That's the worst spot to be in. Right. They think, yeah. you know, it, and then they think you're just messing up on purpose or just being a jackass. Right. Just to spite them. Yeah. Well, who's the, uh, who's the best player you think you've ever, you know, coached or, or been around at the high school level. And I'm, I can't really wink, Shane, but anybody, anybody have, notable? There's, there's, there's two. One is this little Hawaiian dude, Bullet Graft. This kid, he was a throwback player. Like he, when he got the foot, he was like 5'8 and probably like 175. But like this kid was unbelievable. Like he, if he got tackled, he was pissed every single time he got tackled because in his mind, every time he touched the ball, he expected to score a touchdown. <laughs> and so we're at a small school, so we play both ways. And anytime this kid fumbled or, or did something, he played free safety. And, like, the next tackle, that kid was going to fill it. Um, and I just love that kid, man. There was a time where he uh, had a high ankle sprain. And so he had to come out of the game. And he's sitting on the, on the, the trainer's table. And his mom <laughs> – like the tough Hawaiian love mom comes out of the stands and she looks at me and the trainer's like, what are you doing? And we're like, he has a high ankle sprain. She goes, tape it up and get back out there. And the kid hopped up and he started limping back out there. And so that kid to me is one of the best kids I've ever coached. Um, and just like his work ethic, it's like practice. This kid is just wet, just mm -hmm. flipping like wet and just, he has nothing left after any practice, or any game. Um, unfortunately for him, he just didn't have the height and the build to like be a really successful player. Um, the other one, Tyler Buckner, is, I mean, I love that kid. I, I know he gets a, a, a tough rap from this Notre Dame crowd, um, but that kid is, he is special. I, I just remember coming into school 7.30 in the morning and Tyler's already up on the field. He's already drenched from his, his weight workout and then throwing workout. And then after school, he's getting the receivers together to go throw. Like the guy is, I mean, he's he's special. We saw I saw him in sixth grade. I'm like, who is this ninth grader that's not playing football? Because <laughs> we're our school is six through twelve. Yeah. And I'm looking at this kid. I know he's a freshman, but he was in sixth grade and he looked already like he could play football for us. So I know you guys are close. Tyler yeah, and yourself. He's still he's, he, we're always texting back and forth when, you know, things get difficult or there's a challenge. I, I think he respects um, our relationship and respects that I'm going to give the best advice for him, not necessarily for um, the school or, or his parents or whatever. I'm going to give him the best advice. And so I, I think we've built that relationship and really grown that, that, that relationship. 
so two kind of like last little bit questions because you did reach out to me and for folks watching you know shane's on the blue and gold message board and, and yeah i just i think you saw me just going so hard for my boy tyler and the podcast or in the message board yeah. but so going back to tyler's recruitment um yeah obviously you played at notre dame were discussions had like how did you how did you help him navigate that process if at all you know i i my thing was to him was like look i love notre dame and i think it'd be a great fit for you it's a similar offense and you're a notre dame kid mm -hmm. i said but like this is not my choice this is i don't have to live with your this decision for the next four or five years however long it is and so i told him I said, you pick a school based on the academics and if football were to ever go away, can you see yourself being at this place? And and he fell in love with the culture of Notre Dame. He fell in love with the coaching staff. I know he and Tommy Reese were, were really close. Tommy played a was a big role in, in why Tyler committed in the first place. And then he just he loved what Notre Dame stood for. Like it's kind of like for people that don't really understand, like especially when we were there it's a blue collar place right you're not getting this special treatment where you're getting like you know we're fighting to get extra grab and go like an extra sandwich. <laughs> like, that doesn't happen like at any other place like you yeah. get you get one sandwich and one bag one bag of chips and then you're out like what other football place has that and so it it's really is a blue collar thing and i think he really enjoyed that about notre dame i love that so then obviously you're still in each other's lives did you have any advice about this transfer situation? He's obviously landed at Alabama. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, fit overall, et cetera. I know Tyler did not want to leave Notre Dame. He goes, look, I, he goes, I love it here. He goes, I love this place. I love what it stands for. I love my teammates. He goes, I, I just feel like, and I told him, I said, look, like, this is not the college football that I knew. I said, this is now it's a business on both ends. And I said, coach Freeman made a business decision and brought someone in and he's allowed to do that. And I said, now you have a business decision to make as well. Do you see this as a fit for you? Do you see the new offensive coordinator as a fit for you? Do you see um, an opportunity where you, you feel like it's a, it's an open quarterback battle um, or are they just saying that? And, and do you feel like, you know, is the money here like a thing? I said, well, let's just take money out because you know you can get more money at these higher end places. Like, do you really care about the money? He goes, no, like, it's not about the money. He goes, I just want to play with my brothers and I just sure. want to play football and I want to try to make it to the NFL. I said, well, you got to weigh, you got to weigh that. Like, is Notre Dame, if that's your goal to make it to the NFL, is Notre Dame the best place for you to be right now? is alabama the best place is auburn the best place like there was tons of schools calling they were calling me and asking about them and i said you just have to make the best decision for you and and things that align with what your goals are and so last thing, goal, last, last two things and i want to talk on coach freeman because again there's a corollary between coach freeman coach willingham who we played underneath who was tyler's like top three coming out of high school like having you know gone through that process with him I think it was it was Stanford, Notre Dame, and, and like Alabama. Got it. Okay. Last thing, Coach Freeman. I know when Singer pops back on, I'm running long on time. But, <laughs> um, time check. <laughs> what do you think about you know what are we we're going into year three with Coach Freeman as an outsider, and maybe you've got some inside intel through your relationship with Tyler. What's your overall thoughts on what we've seen on the recruiting trail on the football field? What do you think? You know, it's tough. I have college football coaches here every day and i'm like i don't envy you like you not only do you have to recruit all these high school kids but you got to keep recruiting the kids that are at your school and then keep recruiting the kids that you recruited that chose somewhere else i i and i'm a big culture guy and i was like it, that has to be the most difficult position right now you're trying to create culture but you're also bringing in guys over guys that you brought in and guys are leaving like it's it's got to be difficult i i do not envy any college coach right now it, it is it's a different football college football is a different landscape it is more of a business now than it ever has been um and like th there's no more develop a guy and be patient and 
buys your time. Like that doesn't exist anymore. And that didn't just start in college football. That starts with like, I'm watching, uh, we went on a vacation and we we're in like out in the mountains and we we're watching like TV and we had to watch actual cable. And my son was like, he's pushing a button, trying to fast forward to commercials. I'm like, dude, this is not like Netflix or Disney. Like there's commercials. You got to be patient, dude. And like just go through this. And like, that to me is where everything starts, right? None of these kids have to like be patient or wait or like do any of that anymore. Like everyone wants stuff right now and that's adults and kids included. But it's interesting because that goes, lack of patience goes both ways. For sure. Where you're looking at it from a player's perspective, like, man, you know, I, oh, if it ain't working out over here, I can jump ship. Or they think they can jump ship. Yep. You know, I've got a kid that I trained that's in the portal, was the number one player in Nebraska, had 20-something offers, the top 10 corner. He goes in the portal. He's gotten three offers, right, in the portal. But then the lack of patience also, Shane, and this is – I think you can bring this back to Coach Freeman. In my estimation, Coach Freeman was brought here to recruit, to be an elite recruiter. Um, and that ties into that lack of patience with coaches, where a lot of times, and you know this as a high school coach now, college coaches want as close to a finished product as they can, as often as they can. Because I don't now I don't have to worry about quote unquote developing. I can go recruit more kids. Do you agree with that? 100%. And I, and I think, I, I think what they, what, Kelly lacked they got in coach Freeman right I think uh, yeah he's I, I think coach Kelly was a CEO and a pretty good CEO um and I I think what he lacked was the building of relationships with his players um from what I told and then I think Freeman has that right that likability that ability to connect with with the kids and recruits and I think that that was they tried to get in him what Kelly lacked um but this recruiting thing, it, again, it's a mess, dude. And I, I don't have the solution and I don't know the answer. And I, I think it's, there's a, a several levels of like being patient on both ends, right? Like, Hey, you brought this kid here. You believed in him when you brought him here. And like, why do we not believe in him anymore um, to take the reins? So it's, it's, a, it's a tough one, but like, you know, in Notre Dame, if you don't win, like right now, this second, like you're out. Hmm. Shane, you mentioned earlier Tyler's a Notre Dame kid. What yeah. what does that mean to you? Like, what does a Notre Dame, you know, I, I use that term all the time, writing about a recruit that, hey, I just met out on the road. Like, yeah, this is a Notre Dame type kid. That's something we all say. You said it. What does that yeah. mean to you? Uh, so I'll tell you a story. We, we had our banquet and Goolsby was there. With the end of the year banquet, there's a bunch of recruits there. Everyone's in a tie, suit, whatever. And I see this guy in a tuxedo T-shirt. I'm like, that guy's not coming here. So a Notre Dame kid is like a guy that that values the education. It values uh, like the brotherhood. And this is about us. And this is about everyone who came here before us. And it's, and it's a guy that's going to do the right things, but still has some dog in him, right? I think that's a Notre Dame guy. I hope this is not a stupid question. So, <laughs> you know, just, I, yeah, I, yeah. Fingers crossed. If you would have stayed playing soccer, do you think you might have ended up a better soccer player than football player? Because you, you were amazing your freshman year. Yes. I was always a better soccer player than I was a football player. It was, I mean, I played soccer since I was three years old. Football, again, was new for me. Yeah, but unanimous first team All-American. That's, that's, so you think if you would have kept playing soccer, you would have been better than the equivalent of a first team unanimous All-American for football? Yeah, soccer was, I was, yeah, soccer was my sport. I was, again, football was new and I had, there was a lot of nuances I had to learn about it and change my body. And, but soccer was like, that was, that was my sport. That's crazy. That's Shane. Crazy. So I got to witness all this, you know, was it week one we played Maryland and again, God, it sucks yeah. to be like the ex football player. Cause like, you feel like such a loser has been to go back and re you know, retell these stories. But like, you know, week one, we're on the road at Giant Stadium. We play Maryland. And what, you have two picks or three picks in that game? Three. So did you go into that season being like, man, I want to be an All-American? Or was some of this magical? Was some of this just luck? Preparedness meets hard work? What, what, what was it? You know, I had goals. When, when I uh, first transferred over to play football, my first year, like my goal was, I was like, I don't care if I play or not. I want to play, but I want to learn everything I can about football. 
so that next year I wanted what my goal was to start and the next year was to be good. And my fourth year, my goal was to be great. I wanted to be one of the best in the country. And so that was my goal heading into that senior year. I wanted to be one of the best in the country um, at our position. And I think with the defense we had, it like everything works together. Like people, you know, you get an award like as a corner. It's like, yeah, I, got, I made some plays, but shit, I don't make those plays if, you know, big sets not getting in there and hitting the quarterback. I don't make those plays if you and Courtney aren't dropping underneath certain droppers. So it, to me, I think the awards are like, it's skewed and it's like there's no exact science because it, like football you're dependent on everyone else around you yeah um, but that's that you're being kind with your answer <laughs> no thing, Shane. but no you, you're right you're right i had nothing to do with any of your interception except for the one at Rutgers, which uh i, I gave you you know that <laughs> but um but you know what's interesting shane like you talked about mike asked what does it take to be a notre dame man a notre dame fit and I've been like begging for this on that podcast because it is a balance between being a great student. And weren't you like a triple major? Am I making that up in my brain? Yeah, yeah. Damn. Yeah. So unanimous All-American, triple major. I knew I remembered that. But like in some of these games, in these big boy matchups, like a guy like a Shane Walton, a guy like a Benjamin Morrison, like you have to make the play. Whereas mm -hmm. Shane could have tipped that pass, would have been a really good play. But no, Shane's going to do that extra five, 10% thing to make the pick and hell, maybe even make it turn it into a crib call. Yeah, That's what Notre Dame needs to win these big time matchups. And I always talk about, it, it's like, almost like you almost step outside of yourself mm -hmm. and just let it go. Yeah. Can you I talk to that at all, Shane? Yeah. I, I think that was like, my entire life was kind of like that, right? Mm -hmm. Every big game, I had my best game. Yeah. I felt like I owed it to my teammates like to, to will us to win a game. And I was, I, I felt like the moment was never too big. I'm like, I've been here. We've been here. We've all been here. We've done this. Now we just got to go do it. And so I, I think in my mind, I had the confidence and I had the confidence because like I studied the game. I knew what people were going to do. I had the confidence because Mickey got us right in the weight room and in, and in like conditioning. And so all those things led me to believe that like I was good enough to do this and so i think what we were talk, touching on before is like kids have that belief without any of that work and without any of that stuff that that goes into being great and so like my confidence and my belief grew because i'm like i, I had i'd done all the work to to do it it was now it's just about going out and doing it that's and great I, man. I had this thought that i could just make any play but, and i'll say this mike we could probably wrap it up shane you knocked it out of the park brother i've always said you're one of the best people I know, like truly, like you're one of the best people I've ever met. You're a great dude, like rock solid. And I'll say like, as a teammate of yours, like going back in time, like if Shane was on the field, it's like, you knew you had a place to stand. It's like, you, he was always up. It's like, you knew you, you had a place to stand. And that, like, I don't think you could ask for anything more from a teammate, truly. I appreciate it. I, I always remember, uh, we were playing, um, I forget who we were playing. It was a home game early on, and Big Sad was sucking wind. And I used to just dig into people, I'm like, Sad, like cussing him out in his ear, and he's bent over. He looks up at me and goes, if I wasn't so tired, I'd whoop your ass right now. <laughs> and I'm like, but, like, I just believed in every single one of our guys. And, mm -hmm. like, whatever I had to do to bring that out of them, like, I was willing to do it. And, like, I honestly think that, that's kind of what we're missing now. Like someone to get in someone's face and it's like, suck it the fuck up and get your shit together and let's go. Poor said. Like, I did the same thing. I can remember when you yeah, down like Michigan game down, they're out, they're walking into the end zone. I remember he was in the huddle with his head down. I slapped the side of his helmet just to like piss him off. You know what I'm like? Wake up, man. They're about to score. You know Yeah. I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Poor yeah, said. You, you can't do that if you haven't put in the work. Like guys have to see you put in the work because they know oh, yeah. how much it means to you. And they know that they have seen you do that work. So you've earned the right to, to do those things and push people and like pull that out. And again, I think that we recruit nice kids. And like, again, I talked about that dog. You got to have some dog. Like you can have a nice kid, but still have some dog in you. Singer, you got anything else? I'm sweating over here. Better pick six. <laughs> Goolsby against Tennessee or Shane Walton against Drew Brees? Oh. Oh, 
I don't know. Where mine was on the road. There you go. Tennessee's not easy to play. And a linebacker. Seven thousand people. Mine was only eighty two thousand, so gotta give it to the schools. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's Shane Walton, everybody. Appreciate you joining us, Shane. We'll have to have you we'll have to have you on again soon, my friend. I love it. Thanks, guys. Now I get to watch it and, and watch myself look like a fool. So <laughs> appreciate you, fellas. No, you killed it, man. I appreciate it, man. Love you, brother. Love you too, brother. Thanks, Shane. All right, Mike. Oh, well, that was awesome. My favorite thing is, you know, in, in our YouTube stream setup, um, you know, Goolsby and I weren't on the screen, obviously, um, you know, live. We're watching a recorded segment. And uh, I can see Goolsby, though. <laughs> I can just see you laughing back at oh, sure. what you're watching. We were both laughing there at the end. Um, yeah. Thoughts on, uh, you know, listen back to some of that stuff? Yeah, it's just it's it again. I, I every ex player, most of these guys are going to be former teammates of mine. It's selfish of me because I get to catch up with them. But then I, I I think that hopefully fans can re remember who these guys were. It's like damn, I forgot Shane was a unanimous All American. I forgot how good that O two defense really was because time flies. There's a recency bias. Um, so it's a win, 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 win all the way around for me. So I get to catch up with old teammates, hopefully share some more stories that I fo hope folks and fans get a kick out of. But that was interesting. You know, and Shane, you know, he's a coach and he said the right things. And he alluded to a couple little things in regards to the Buckner thing. And we'll let people kind of, uh, you know, maybe listen back. Because um, how do I phrase that, Mike? He, he kind of glossed over a thing with the quarterback competition um but no it was great and again shane is a he's one of a kind and he's a just a great tremendous person and a great teammate yeah you love and, those air uh, quotes when you talk about the uh the quarterback competition i've noticed that yeah we're moving on we're moving on we're moving on well i think that's gonna wrap up this week's mike goolsby show um yeah if you're just joining us go back to the very beginning we had some good stuff we talked about starting ob uh I should say you know, starting O slash defense, uh, really cool interview with uh, JP Cone um, about, you know, maybe getting some of you guys over to the Ireland game. When we were playing the interview, I, I, I left the room and talked to my wife. I was like, I was like, we got to get over there. Like we got to make this happen. And when I told yeah, her about the, the 30th birthday deal being a big thing in Ireland, she's like, you're joking. Like you're just making that up. I was like, no, it's real. Yeah. It's the thing. If you're going to go, if you were thinking about going book this trip, use my code ghouls before one, and then we get to hang out, and then I think we'll be able to create some kind of unique content while we're over there. So it should be fun. And I am more than happy to crush Guinness with our listeners, um, by all means. You know, I've hung out with Notre Dame fans, you know, out on the road. And, you know, it's a really good opportunity for you guys to get what we really think on some things that we would not say. Like we're totally honest, right? That's, that's a big thing. Like we're going to be completely honest with you guys, but there's some things we're just, you know, we're not going to say on YouTube, you know, we're just not going to go out of our way. So what like, you're saying, yeah, if you're six Guinness is deep, you're going to divulge a little bit more than you yeah. were on the YouTube oh, yeah. channel. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know, yeah, I'll, well, yeah, I'll just leave it there. I, I tell stories. <laughs> I tell certain stories about you know different things in recruiting and just experiences. So, yeah, I mean, if you want to go anyways, might as well use that code Goolsby forty one, and then uh, yeah, then you get to hang out with us. It's just see what happens. happens. Bonus. Either way, um, it was great having JP on. It seems like a fun time. Great interview with Shane. Uh, it was good to be back, and again, we're just. Counting down the minutes till August 26th. August 26th. Thank you. <laughs> you saved me there. But yeah. Well, it's my birthday. I should know it. Amen. Uh, Goolsby, you already got the wheels, you know, kind of spinning on who our next big guest is. Oh, I've got a Rolodex, man. And I try to, I try to correlate like an ex player and then make a link to the current team. So I played with two guys, Maurice Stovall, who was on the cover of Sports Illustrated as a true freshman, and Raymond McKnight. They both came in together uh, and found success early. Both super fun personalities, great teammates, again. 
And I think it'd be fun to get those two on to talk for 20, 30 minutes about their experience being a young, young receiver. I just, I think it'd be an interesting corollary with the current wide receiver room. I think this summer when Notre Dame, like recruiting really, really heats up with a bunch of, bunch of commitments. I think let's get Preston Jackson back on to talk some recruits. He's in. I mean, he was our first guest we've ever had years ago. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's, it's whatever. I mean, Take requests. Uh, again, folks, like leave them in the comments. Hit the like button. As a YouTuber, every YouTube video I watch, Mike, I like it. Just because yeah. I'm a YouTuber now. So it's like if you're watching it, like it. Somebody put the effort out. Somebody but, uh, yeah, leave a comment who you want to see. The folks that I'm going to probably get a, get a hold of and vibe with are probably, again, more recent players last 20 years or so. Uh, but, again, Aaron Taylor knocked it out of the park. But, yeah, I think it's been good for the good for the, good for the brand, if you will. It has been. All right, well, that's going to wrap up this week's My Goolsby Show. Appreciate you folks for watching. Again, if you're just joining in live, uh, rewind, watch to the beginning. Uh, hit that thumbs up, like Goolsby said. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, of course, for more Notre Dame football and recruiting content for podcast audience. Please leave a nice review. And, of course, everyone, uh, go to blueandgold.com for all things Notre Dame football and recruiting. Appreciate you all. And, as always, we will catch you next time.